title sponsor of the Barclays Women's Super League on Sky Sports. The governing body at the time thought it was a sport that was not healthy for females. 50 years, if we weren't banned, we could be further forward than we are now. I know there's more conversation, but I don't really see the change. One of the things I refused to do was fail. For every other female, for every other black female that comes next. Hope has left an incredible legacy. Hello and welcome to a special edition of Inside the WSL. Now with the league going from strength to strength, season by season, this week we want to focus on a trailblazer who helped make that possible. A woman who has fought to revolutionise the women's game in England for more than two decades. Hope Powell. Hope, it's such a pleasure uh, to what see a, you. What an intro, Jess. Is that Thank enough? You. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. You happy with that? Yeah, two decades makes me feel and sound very old. Well, I'm not that old. You're not. You're not old. You're uh, still young. Yeah, Age is yeah. nothing but a number. But yeah. when you think women's football, you can't help but think of the name Hope Powell. Now, many will know you as a manager, a coach, a mentor. But before all of that, you were a player. What was it that first made you fall in love with the sport? Ah, uh, good question. I, I grew up on an estate. Um, loads of boys. Uh, I was always good at sport. Every sport, I could probably play anything but I think football was the one that I loved. And I think it was the World Cup in, I have to remember, was it 78? 78 in Argentina? 78. Yes, um, I loved it. I watched every game, then after every game, where I could anyway, I'd used to go out on the estate in the cage and play back home, watch a game. For some reason, I had this obsession with the game. So you were born in the 60s at a time when women were effectively banned from playing football mm -hmm. by the FA. Mm -hmm. So what were the attitudes when you were a young girl to women, to girls playing football? Well, when I, when I uh, grew up and I was playing on the estate, I honestly thought I was the only girl that played. There were no teams, no, you know, playing with the boys. They couldn't understand why was a girl playing, older people why was a girl playing. And then obviously I... I joined Mill Lionesses at the time, um, at the age of 11. That was just mind-blowing. I went to a first training session and there were loads of girls playing football. And that was the night. first time you were aware that other girls other played? Other girls played. I was actually shocked. Back then, there were probably a couple of people and their dogs, family members, and people would... We played on Clapham Common, for example, um, and people would walk by and double-check Girls, you know, playing. Did that ever bother you? Not really. Some not people might be time. deterred by that. Mm, never bothered me. Not not while I was playing. It was just the, all the the girls I was playing with. It was just the love of the game, mm. and it was as competitive as it ever was, you know. But the pitches were awful. You had to put the, your own nets up, goals <laughs> up. Half time was orange juice. So when you started playing and it started getting serious at that age of 11, you're mm -hmm. at Millwall. Mm -hmm. Your mum didn't like it, did she? Not at She all. wasn't a fan of it and she Not banned you from playing. She, she thought she did. How did you get didn't. around it? Uh, I sneaked out most of the time. Um, I think basically, you have to understand, my mum's obviously West Indian, West Indian culture. Girls playing football wasn't seen as a thing. Um, didn't understand it, um, okay for boy child, not necessarily for girl child, different roles. Um, so when I started to play, she couldn't understand what's going on. She said I couldn't go and I just snuck out once and then you can imagine I got home and that was it, all hell to pay. But I think what she realised is that, um, number one, it kept me out of trouble. Um, I was good at it. And um, she, she was very much, uh, you, you know, Jamaica, came here very young, trying to make a better life, really struggled. She wanted me to do well at school. School was the priority. 
football, you know, girls, you can't make a living in football. There's no, no way you can make a profession out of football. So I think she was just trying to look out for me and I absolutely understand it. I think what was really lovely and still lovely today, when she actually came and she started supporting and, you know, she's just obsessed. She sometimes calls me up and goes, do you know the girls are playing? Do you know, are you watching? Are you watching? You know, she came over to Germany when we played in the Euro finals. She used to come and watch all the England games. She is now my biggest fan. Have you always been the type of person that if someone tells you no, you don't necessarily hear it and you do what you feel like you want to do, what is right in the moment? If I feel that the no is not justified, I will challenge it. You, you know, without, I don't believe in compromising myself or my values, but I will definitely fight in things I believe that are right. And that's probably helped you achieve what you've achieved throughout your, your career as a player and as a manager, yeah. right? And, and changing I, I women's so. football. I, I think so. I think, um, you, you know, as a player, actually I knew at the age of 11 I was good enough to play for England. I absolutely categorised, and that's not being arrogant, I just, I was better than every boy on my estate, every boy I ever played against. Um, when I got played for Millwall, I was arguably the best player. Um, I just, you know, I found out there was an England team and I thought, well, you know, that's the next thing I'm going to do. What do you remember then about your call up to England? You said at 11 that you were going to play for England and you reached 16 years of age and you get the call up. About time. No, <laughs> that's a joke. Joke. Um, yeah, I, I was um, really pleased. I think I knew it was coming. It, it was just a weekend, Friday to Sunday. You'd meet up on the Friday, you carry your own, you know, today they get cars and, you know, so they cars and chauffeured everywhere. You'd get on the train with your big case, you know, your own kit, no kit provided. You'd go for three days of hell because it was hard work. But, but the call up was, yeah, I was excited, you know, looking forward to it. But also a little bit, you know, 16, it was, you know, a bit nervy and, and you know, you go into that environment as a young kid, the, the, the players that have been there longer obviously look at you and go, you won't be taking my place. You know, it's natural because everybody wants to play. And I'm thinking I will be taking your place. So that was the call up. And what about your first cap? The time that you, you pulled on that England jersey for the first time and actually got onto the pitch, 1983 it was. From what I can remember, please don't go on. I think I touched the ball, <laughs> um, but definitely I think you recognise the step up is mm. a step up. And I think I came away thinking I've probably got to do more. You were a young girl realising that you perhaps weren't fit enough or weren't perhaps strong enough to play senior football. So you asked someone to write you a specific fitness program, right? Yeah, he'll be pleased I mention his name on every <laughs> interview. So Alan May, who was my coach for Millwall, right. I think he was, he was ahead of his time. And so I said to him, look, can you just write me a program so that I can go and do a bit extra? I think back in those days, you only trained two nights a week on concrete, by the way. Um, so you're going to school, after school, you're getting on a bus, going training, getting home late, you, you know different world um, but that's how it was then and I just thought I'm not fit enough here to compete with um, women that are physically stronger more mature uh, I need to do something so I asked him to do me a program and he did and then I would go out in the evening on my own and do these crazy runs this is why I can't walk today my knees are gone um, and just just try and get fitter and stronger, and that's what I did. Who were some of the best players that you enjoyed playing alongside? Brenda Sampari is definitely by far the best player I've ever played with or against. And she was an England international England well. international, played for Fulham, very good friends still. We, we uh, uh, start playing on a Thursday night some kind of not not quite walking football but a bit of fun it's it's like crazy Brenda's on one team and I'm on the other is it super competitive uh, we are competitive we can't run <laughs> but even so we're like that but she was an exceptional talent 
Kelly Smith I had the privilege of playing with um, very briefly um, and again another super super talent um, and they don't come along very often so generational you know, generational Brent Sempari Kelly Smith I would say the next one if you would like me to say it I think it's probably Lauren James who I think is an incredible incredible footballer and some of the most memorable games that you've played in, what, what are they? FA Cup final, beating Doncaster Bells. Yeah, who were the, the team. Who were the team. They and were we the Chelsea were like, of the day, weren't they? Yeah, we're not having that. And we used to sing the bells aren't ringing anymore. That was <laughs> pleasurable. It was just a, a completely different time then where the players were paying to play. You didn't have your own kits. Facilities were poor. It wasn't professional. There was next to no media coverage, but do you look back fondly on those days and oh, do yeah. you enjoy oh, yeah. that experience of being oh, a player? Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a minibus going up to Doncaster on the day, everybody's knackered. The nice thing is that it was, we did it for the love of the game. I'm not saying players don't do that now, but we paid we paid to play. We we had to go back and go and you know go to work or go to school, and it was more about the social side of it. You know these these people I played with. I still know. You know this is how old am I? I have to remember. Forty years down the line, they are still my friends. I still know them. I still have a relationship with them. You know, and we all sit and watch football together. Or you know, when it isn't going well, going mad. They're not good enough. We're better than they. But we all say. We're better than all of them. Imagine if we'd have had what they, and we, I played with some talent. I played with some real talent that, you know, I can name you know, Brenda Sampari, Angie Gallimore, Marianne Spacey, Jill Coulthard, Debbie Bampton. These were talented players. Had you had the support that the players have now, what could you have achieved? As good as, as good, definitely. And I'm not just saying that, but we had some natural talent. I'm not saying the girls are girls are very talented, but we had some talent. And every one of them, we, they all go, they, we all go, oh, they've been so much better than us. <laughs> yeah. a, bit, a bit of green eye, I think, a yeah. bit of envy. I think, um, you know, you look at it and I think we all wished we had the opportunity to be a professional footballer. Let's focus on your career as a manager. Let's start with England because it's 1998. You're just 31, still playing maybe realising that your body is becoming a bit more injury prone and then you get a call from the FA and you meet with them and they offer you to take charge of the England women's national team. Like for so many people that would be a, a pinch me moment, a, an opportunity that would change their lives but you <laughs> didn't say yes oh, no. straight away. No. Why not? I was terrified. <laughs> I think it was Robin Russell who you know, I hope we'd like you to consider or be the uh, next England manager. Okay. So what's going through your mind? Um, yeah, I was a little bit, oh my God, what's, what, what, pardon? Although I did hear it, so, you know, I'm really calm on the top and underneath I'm like, oh my God, my legs are going. So I was a little bit, oh, what's going on here? I haven't managed, I haven't, have you, you know, and I started to ask other questions, have you considered anybody else? Why are you picking me? It, it was a big deal, but I wanted to be sure, why I wanted to be sure, that it was for the right reasons, that they actually valued what I could bring to the table. I was with Brenda Sampari at the time, I went round to Brenda's, They've offered me this, this job. I don't know if I should take it. I'm a little bit, why would they do that? She looked at me and she just went, are you crazy? If you don't take this job, I will batter the living blah, 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 out of you, as, as did my partner at the time, my family. You've got to take it. You've got... I was still a little bit, it's all right for you to say I've got to take it. I'm the one who's got to do the job. And then I think it was, it was Kelly Simmons who actually said to me, you know what, Hope, you'll be sitting in the changing room, you know, with an England manager, and you'll be sitting there thinking, I could have done that job. And I think that was the, and I thought, you know what, she's probably right. And that's what, what um, after a week, I took the week, that's what ultimately made my mind up. And I think one of the things I thought was, oh God, I cannot fail this. I can't fail for me. I can't fail for women. I can't fail for, for 
future black coaches. I remember growing up and seeing you on the sidelines as this black woman who was also cool and controlled and, and calm on the sidelines with these dreads. Mm. And I'd never seen a woman that looked like you in that high of a position before. So you felt that responsibility, did you, to represent not yeah, just did. yourself, but the various communities as well? Yeah, when I got the job at the FA, I didn't have dreads. I grew dreads while I was at the FA. For a reason? Yeah, to make a statement. What was that statement? Just that, look, we're repre I'm representing black people from everywhere, you know, and, and um, you know, I guess I'm a bit militant as well, you know, I just thought, yeah, this would be cool, and I just decided, I decided to do it. For me, it was a big deal. It was because I knew, you know, I'm, I'm being looked at by every, because everybody thinks they can do a better job than you anyway, whether it's male or female. Um, I knew eyes would be on me, everybody would be on me. It was just me. I didn't have an assistant, uh, you know, all these people were part-time, I had nothing. I was given a... So you were overseeing the senior team plus all the age groups yeah. that you were trying to build as well, So I came in, senior team, and then UEFA had just introduced an under uh, 18 or 19 European Championship. We didn't have a team, so I had to put together a team um, that could go and represent in the European Championship. So I was responsible for that, responsible for that. I had no staff. I was given, it, it, you know, I was given a Lancaster Gate, a desk, there you go. Hmm. I think 15 years I was there, every, every opportunity I felt we needed something to get better, I would have that conversation, going to the board meetings, we need this, go to Howard, we need this. And it was a real fight, because quite a lot of the time it was a no. When you got the job in 1998, what were your main priorities? What did you single out as the things that most needed to change to make that team better? More games, more contact time with players playing against teams that could challenge them. I remember we, we played uh, Norway in a game, a friendly, it might have been a qualifier. One of the world's best teams yeah. at the time. Played all the kids and knew we would lose and we lost 8-0. I think Kate Chapman played, Farrah might have played. Kelly definitely played that, that kind of generation. They had to play it to appreciate if they wanted to be the best, we got some work to do. So I had to take the risk that we were gonna get hammered um, in order to, to, for the players and staff and the FA to recognize mm -hmm. we need this and we need this and we need this. The players need I think I introduced centralised contracts, I don't think I did introduce centralised contracts so the players could dedicate more time to training. It was clearly working because England improved, um, made jumps and strides up the world rankings. And then in 2009, clearly your reputation is becoming quite known because you get linked with a job in the men's game at Grimsby Town. The press are almost certain that you are in line to take over as the manager of this club. News to me. Well, how did that, that happen? Was news to me. Were you I, interested? I had no idea, no. I had no conversation for the record with Grimsby, none. I remember it distinctly. Um, I just got out of the shower, my dressing gown, BBC <laughs> News on. Hope Powell's linked to Grimsby and Hope, if you're watching this show, please can you come into the studio? <laughs> I thought, this is, it just made me laugh. I'm like, She's been seen, I think it was, she's been seen in Grimsby with, I don't know, the chair, chair the owner. And I was talking to the telly, no, I haven't, because I've been in this hotel preparing for a game. Have you been to Grimsby? No. <laughs> no disrespect to Grimsby, but Grimsby, England. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm working with the best players in the country, the national team, yeah, doing okay. I'm, I'm not... Why, why would I want to go to Grimsby? After 15 years at the top, the England women's uh, national manager, you, your time with the FA came to an end. When you look back on that time, do you feel as though it was the right time to, to step away? Or did you feel you had more that you were still able to do with that team, that you could have taken them even further? I didn't step away. Um... Uh, they removed me, which is okay. This is, is the game. Uh, yeah, I, th I thought there was, it, it was interesting because it was 2013. We didn't do as well as we would have liked. Um, and after that, it was like the next generation already. You know, 
they're ready and I would have changed things and, and uh, would like to have stayed and, and thought I still could have added value. But we all know that this is, it's football, isn't it? But you got to work with some incredible players during that time. Yeah, some really Who good, the good players. players that you most enjoyed coaching? Kelly, Kelly Smith doesn't understand about coaching. She just doesn't. She's just a player. That's just a waste of time, you know. Couldn't she, coach her. I think the best players sometimes don't, don't appreciate what they're doing because it's so natural. Brenda Sempari was like it. Kelly Smith was like it. You know, Kelly, have you thought about, oh, I don't, what do you mean? You, you know, um, and as she got older, obviously that appreciation of coaching, she was just a talent. Mm. Kelly, I remember what, she had a bit of a, a lack of confidence, would you believe, in, in her ability. And I just said to Kelly, every time you get the ball, I just want you to dribble. Just dribble with it, just to get her confidence back and, you know, put a player in front of her with the ball, she's going to go round you. She was such a talent, but quite often didn't realise what she was doing in the moment because it was so natural. Talk to me about that goal celebration in the 2007 World where Cup. She, where she, she scored, her, took, her took her boot, her boot off. off lifted it up yeah. to the crowd and kissed it. Yeah. You didn't like that, did you? No, I just... I saw, saw that, that and I went wild. Yeah. I loved that celebration. Yeah. yeah, but when you're the manager <laughs> sitting there thinking she's targeted on the pitch anyway, she's had so many injuries and people are like, I'm just said to her, what are you doing? Everybody's going to look at they're going to want to bloody come and foul you and why would you do that? It was but just such just of a with, spur of the yeah, moment celebration, sure it was, wasn't it? I, I look back on it and I understand why she did it. At the time, I'm thinking about the next game and people looking at her thinking, oh, you arrogant, we're going to, you know, injure you. And she was just too valuable a player. Farrell Williams definitely was always going to be somebody who would be um, in the game. You know, I know she's doing punditry now, equally as an exceptional coach. She was addicted to football, um, but really enjoyable to coach. Karen Carney, enjoyable to coach, um, came in very young, well, had a talent, probably didn't have an appreciation at that time of how good she was. Casey, been on a journey when she first came in, she was a difficult kid, really had some challenges with her, to be honest. Attitude work. Yeah, she just had a difficult time that we had to kind of knock out of her pretty sharpish. But again, another one you could sell was, was had a real understanding of the game, you know, and, and it made it pleasurable most of the time. So it wasn't always easy because I think everybody wants to play and everybody thinks they're good enough to play. But as a manager, you have a really tough decision and you can only play 11 players. I think it really makes me smile when I see them all doing punditry and speaking so eloquently about the game and I'm thinking god when I coach you you just didn't have a clue so it just shows how people develop and mature and then from from leaving the FA in 2013 to becoming Brighton manager in, in 2017 you, you know you established Brighton in the WSL yeah a, I think a, so. you know, a, t a team that were well organized and very good defensively yeah. um, and you also oversaw the the women's facilities yeah. that were yeah. rebuilt and everything but the time came to an end there as well, sadly. Yeah, you felt yeah. it was the right time for you? Yeah, I think I took the team as far as I could and my enjoyment was starting to wane. We didn't have a lot of players, made it very difficult. I just got a bit tired, to be honest. And uh, yeah, fantastic club, fantastic people. Do you have any fears about what the game could become and, and how it could be negatively impacted by the fact that it is becoming more commercial now? Um, yeah, I, I hope that, that it doesn't become a product where the players aren't, the welfare and care of the players stops becoming the priority. Um, I think the players are the priority. Without the players, we don't get all the other stuff. Um, and their well-being and health should never be compromised due to the commercial deals or the TV coverage or, you know, playing however many games throughout a season and, and stuff like, you know, some of the challenges the men's game. I think we, we've got a real opportunity to learn from the men's game and not make those mistakes that the men's game have, you know, the, the scheduling and the calendar and, you know, it's quite a challenge in the men's game, I, I would say. Um, and I hope that that doesn't happen in the women's game. And we, I'm hoping it's sustainable. What's happening, I'm hoping the investment will be there and it's sustainable for, for a long period of time. 
What's your proudest achievement? I think I'm proud of all of it, the fact that I've been in the game, I've contributed to the game, and I still feel I can contribute going forward. So I think there's still more to come. So maybe when I've retired, Jess, you can ask me what I'm most proud of. Hope, thank you so much for your time this thank week. You. Thank you for sharing your story as a player and as a manager for us here on Inside the WSL. It's been great. Thank you for having me.